Good morning. It's good to see you all again this morning, joining us either in person or online. Welcome to Westminster Seminary, California, and our Dendalk Lecture Series. Um, Westminster Seminary, California, and seminaries in general exist for churches. We are in the reserve lines providing workers and laborers and pastors for the front lines. And our second president, Robert G. Dendolk, recognizing the importance of pastors and leaders for local churches and having been engaged in seminary education for over three decades, in 1993, along with friends of the Dendolks, established this uh, endowed uh, funding for this lecture series in order to bring seasoned and wise pastors to our pulpit or our podium to teach us about the joys and rigors of pastoral ministry. And so we're delighted to actually have you join us this morning in our second of three lectures. And as we begin, let's all stand together and turn to the Trinity hymnal, which is the red one, 585, all the verses this morning, or Trinity Psalter 538, if you so uh, prefer. Please be seated. Well, yesterday we had a wonderful beginning and a challenging message titled Pastoral Excellence and Humility. This morning, we're continuing with the larger title, Is the Local Church Too Small a Thing for You? With today's lecture title, Pastoral Leadership and Humility. Uh, our speaker this morning, already introduced yesterday in many ways, is the favorite preacher for my teenage daughter since she was about 12 or 13 when she can start understanding Sunday sermons to the fullest. We're delighted to have Reverend Ted Hamilton join us. He is a graduate of Stanford undergrad and a Stanford Law School. And I forgot to mention his wife, Linda Hamilton, who grounds the family, is actually a UCLA Bruin. And that's the important part of this family combination, as far as I can tell. He serves as an adjunct uh, at-large board member for Westminster Seminary, California. Also serves on the board of Mission to the World, which is the missions agency of our denomination. And has been serving as pastor of New Life PCA, his first and only call after his career as a lawyer for the last 21 years or so. Most importantly, he is married to Linda. They have two children. Now they have four grandchildren uh, whom they get to enjoy each and every single time as they live locally and nearby. 
We're delighted to have him join us again this morning. Pastoral Leadership and Humility is the title. So welcome again, Ted. Please join us. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction, Joel. Thank you, everybody. Good to be all uh, with you all again this morning. Before we start, let me open in prayer. Father, I thank you for a new day. We worship you, um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons in one God. Glory be to your name today. Father, be with us. May this time be helpful and encouraging. Um, may it redound to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, before we get into the topic of the, the morning, which is pastoral leadership I, and how that intersects with humility, uh, I want to circle back briefly to that subtitle of this series, the, the Impact and Challenges of Dedicated Service to One Congregation. Uh, what I was really, of course, trying to communicate in that subtitle is that a, a long-term pastorate uh, opens the door to, to great spiritual impact, while at the same time uh, opening uh, the door to significant challenges. But in my view, the spiritual impact of a, of a long pastorate outweighs uh, the challenges uh, all day long. My, my working presupposition is, is that a long-term pastorate is generally better and healthier for a pastor and for his people uh, than a short-term pastorate. Um, I've, I've tried to do some research, statistical research. Uh, I, I did find some statistics which seem to suggest that a, that a long-term pastorate is no guarantee that your church will grow, uh, but a short-term pastorate is a virtual guarantee that your church will not. Um, that's sort of proving by a negative, I suppose, but um, it, uh, I, I think the presupposition uh, that a long-term pastorate is generally better and healthier is, is valid for at least uh, three reasons. First, as we talked about yesterday, uh, the process of Christian growth uh, is organic, and since it's organic, it, it, that means it's not fast. It's not dramatic. Uh, oftentimes, you know, like w watching uh, your garden grow, you, you, you don't see it growing. Um, it's, it's so slow. Um, it, it, pastoral work, Christian growth, slow, steady, patient, quiet. And a, and a long-term pastorate gives the time and the space for the pastor and his people uh, to, uh, to allow that slow work to happen. Second, I think second reason uh, a long-term pastor is preferred is that our work, you, you know, we're shepherds. Uh, that's what pastor means. And we are technically under shepherds of the great shepherd. Uh, and our work, therefore, should, should mirror who our great shepherd is. And he is, as I prayed this morning, fundamentally Trinitarian. All right? God is personal. He is within himself three persons who are interpersonally relational. So our pastoring should reflect God's nature. Our pastoring should be like God, both personal and relational. And to develop personal relationships within which ministry effective ministry can take place simply takes an irreducible amount of time uh, and, and effort. The longer you live with your people, uh, the deeper and more impactful those relationships become. And then third, third reason, um, a long-term pastor I believe is to be preferred precisely because it will bring you to the end of your human resources. Uh, and, and and in doing that, make you rely on the strength of the Lord. Um, this is, in other words, a, a long-term pastorate is going to put you in a position where you are most likely to be personally uncomfortable but spiritually strong. Uh, Short-term pastorates, 
let you fake it uh, if you are so inclined. Uh, you may have seen this phenomenon, right? Um, you, can, you can, for a time, bring your best stuff. Uh, you can bank on the honeymoon phase of being the new guy uh, for a while, and then you can get out of Dodge before people realize who you really are. Um, the um, long-term pastorates minimize the fake factor. That, that's a good thing. It's also a humbling thing, right? Because what, what my people realize after 21 years is um, um, the Lord has a sense of humor on whom he calls uh, uh, to, to, be, to be a pastor, right? They, they know I'm a sinner. Um, I have had to apologize to my people on, on multiple occasions because of things I've said or done. Um, uh, that is personally humbling, but I think in terms of ministry, it's a good thing, right? It, it, it reinforces the truth that we are, uh, this isn't about us, that we're not trying to build a fan club. Uh, we don't want people to worship us or be amazed at us. We want them to look beyond us and to be amazed at and to worship Jesus. Uh, and, um, you know, a, a long-term pastorate will, will, will reveal uh, all of the chinks in your armor. Um, but that's, a, as I said, that's a good thing. I, I'm not going to be dogmatic on this point, though. Uh, and and there, there, of course, there are going to be times and circumstances as God leads in his providence, right, where uh, it will be appropriate for you to leave one call and accept another. Uh, don't hear me as trying to say to you uh, in these lectures, you know, the, very, the first call you take, you, you have to stay there at, at for 40 years just to show you can. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's not the point. Uh, and here's where I have to correct the intro uh, 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 slightly, Joel. Uh, New Life was my second call. My first call was, just a, was however, just a year long. So, I mean, I, you know, here I am talking to you about dedicated service to one congregation. <laughs> and, uh, and my first call was one year long. Uh, you know, uh, full, full disclosure. Um, I was called as an associate pastor uh, upon graduation in 2000 to my home church uh, up in Irvine. Uh, in Orange County, um, and uh, you need to be fair. Uh, I was not looking for a call, uh, although I almost was. I had, uh, I had really, I'd gone to seminary. I was in my forties when I went to seminary, really believing that God had was calling me to preach, and yet got through the three years, graduated, and I get called to an associate pastor position where I wasn't preaching or at least preaching seldomly, uh, and, but I was doing a lot of teaching, and I was frustrated. I, w I was frustrated that this didn't match uh, m my understanding of, of my call, um, and so I was working through that frustration, thinking about it, praying about it, talking with my wife Linda about it, and I had, and I finally got to a point where I made a decision. I, I resolved that I would uh, be, uh, uh, that I would not look for another call, that this is where God placed me. I was going to put my head down, uh, put any frustration aside, put my head down and do my best uh, in the call that God had given me. After all, I loved the church. I loved uh, the people I was working with. I loved the congregation. Uh, and, and I had a gr wonderful opportunities to do ministry. It just wasn't the ministry I was expecting. Um, but, and, 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 the, and, and that ministry was proving fruitful. So uh, I, I, I made that decision, and I was um, I settled in it. Like a week later, new life comes calling. Um, and I, I wonder, you know, I, one reads God's providence at his peril, interprets God's providence at his peril, it went, what, what was in God's mind. But I, I have wondered whether God wanted me to get to the point of of uh, submitting to his will and accepting that if this is uh, his call uh, that I would embrace it and and uh, and uh, fulfill it. 
uh, because that's where I got to. Uh, and, and then the call came. Uh, still, it was a difficult decision to make. And I, and I do want to tell you just a bit about that because I got some helpful wisdom as I was considering the call to New Life. So New Life's technically my second call. Um, and um, I was struggling with, with the call. What, you know, what, is, what did it mean for me? I just made this decision to buckle down and embrace my current call. Um, you know, my kids were in school. My wife was happy. I was happy. Uh, lots of dislo potential dislocation. But this call was m matching up with my original sense of how, what, what my calling was. And I was, so I was really struggling. And, and my, the senior pastor, my boss, um, called me into his office. Uh, he says, he said, Teddy, because I can see you're really struggling with this, with this decision. Uh, he says, maybe, maybe I can help. He says, maybe you should think about this call, I I this opportunity, uh, in, in kingdom terms. And I wasn't sure what he meant. Well, yeah, what do you mean by thinking of it in kingdom terms? He goes, well, it's pretty easy. He says, how many pastors does New Life have? Zero. How many pastors do we have? I think we have like six. And, and then he just sort of let that, my two answers there, hang in the air for a moment. Um, and he didn't say it, but I could tell he was thinking, what's the issue, dummy? <laughs> right? It's essentially, he, he, what he did say politely was, well, maybe th that, those facts should guide your decision here more than how y you're accepting the call is going to affect you or your family or your wife. And he was absolutely right. And, and what that did was take a lot of the emotion, a lot of the heat uh, out of the decision. It, it was still a diff, you know, you, you still have to go through the difficulties of a move, but it, it made the decision much easier. So I, I, I give that to you. Maybe uh, my senior pastor's wisdom will help you someday as you consider uh, a call you receive. Think about it in kingdom terms. I think, I think there's some real wisdom there. Uh, Final reminder uh, before we turn to the topic of leadership. Uh, as we discussed yesterday, my, my other working proposition here in, in these lectures is that many pastors, not all, but many pastors, are, are not sufficiently valuing the work uh, of the local church, especially the smaller local church, um, and are instead looking for bigger and more influential positions and assignments uh, both inside the church and outside the church, because they have glory-seeking hearts uh, and they have uncritically embraced cultural values which they have brought into both their thinking about and their practice of ministry. Okay? That's what we talked about yesterday. Uh, and those cultural values put a premium on what the Bible calls selfish ambition and downplays what we know as Christian humility. Uh, you know, it, it, it really is, sadly, worldly pride on parade so often in the church. But we're not the world, right? We're, we're the kingdom uh, uh, of God. We live by uh, the values of God's kingdom, and those values are radically countercultural. Um, so, and, and, and there's no area, it seems to me, where this process of cultural accommodation is, becomes more evident than in the issue of pastoral leadership, which is uh, our topic this morning. So let's, let's uh, segue into that. If you're the lead pastor of your church, there is no question that the single most important component of your job description is the ministry of the word and sacrament. Right, that's the non-negotiable, indispensable center and core of any church. And, and it is primarily on your plate as the lead pastor. It's absolutely necessary. Everything else that the church does hangs off of the ministry of the word uh, and sacrament. But the ministry of the word and sacrament does not exist by itself. I mean, one of the things you are as a lead pastor, for sure, is a multitasker. Um, 
your, your task isn't just to preach. It's not just to administer the sacraments. As a shepherd of God's people, uh, your task is also to lead. Right? Think, think about what a shepherd does. Right? Psalm 23. Uh, he he uh, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Right? A, sh- a shepherd pre- preeminently brings his sheep to food and water. And as a pastor, that's what you do. Uh, bringing your people uh, to uh, spiritual food and water. And, and, and to do that, you have to lead. Shepherds lead. And you have to lead well. If you don't lead well, uh, your preaching, no matter how well you preach, eventually they're not going to hear your preaching. I mean, look, look at some of the high-profile train wrecks we've seen in the last few years in the larger evangelical church. By and large, these pastors who train wrecked were extraordinarily gifted communicators, right? These men had extraordinary preaching gifts. Where they failed, if, if it wasn't a morals problem, was primarily in their leading. Their preaching might have been all about Jesus, but their leading wasn't. And, and that mismatch between one's preaching and one's leading uh, ultimately makes a ministry unsustainable. So that's that, one of the main challenges, it seems to me, of long-term pastorate is that challenge of leading well over the long haul. You know, it's, you, it's one thing to lead a church for a few years. It's one thing to lead a church through a single crisis. Uh, it's another thing to lead for decades, because in decades you're gonna you're gonna hit hit it all, right? Good times, bad times, times of crisis, times of plenty, times of want. Sounds like a marriage. Well, it kind of is like a marriage. Yeah, so it is. It, and you know, marriage is a challenge. So so is long term pastoring, and it, but it's a challenge that by God's grace can be met, and it can be successfully met. So. What I want to address this morning, just with two, two main points. First, I want to unpack the problem a little bit more, the, this, this, the problem of, of pastoral leadership and inter, in, it, in its intersection with Christian humility. Uh, and then I want to look at three principles um, that I hope you'll find helpful that will help you avoid the pitfalls, um, the, the potential pitfalls of... Um, leadership. So it's pro- the problem and then the then three principles to avoid the pitfalls. So first the problem. I have to, you know, disclaimer here, I am not a management expert uh, nor am I any kind of leadership guru. In fact, I'm sort of the anti-leadership guru. I've, I've tried to read the management books and the leadership books. I mean, they come out, you know, with regularity. Uh, they're off. They're you know they're often the hot books that you know every leader should read. I've read some of those. I've t- I've tried to read others. I've I've generally now realized that my eyes will glaze over. It's just it's just uh, not my passion. Um, but that's saying more about me than about the topic. The topic's important. I, I, I don't want to denigrate the importance of, of effective management and leadership at all. Um, I was a, I, I labored as senior pastor for about what, 15, 16 years at New Life uh, as the primary leader. Right, uh, senior pastor, leader, uh, and um, over that time, you know, we, it, the, the, the church grew some, evolved, changed. Um, and, and at one point, uh, I think it was in 2016, I had uh, a meeting with uh, sort of an executive committee of the, of the session, and one of, the, one of my wise elders asked me, a good question. He says, uh, "What keeps you up at night?" Um, and and the answer was an easy one for me. And I said, "It's my leadership." I, I, I said, "I really think with the varying 
just the, the way the job has evolved, I'm dropping the ball with, with effectively leading uh, the staff, uh, and, um, uh, and, I, and I really need help. And so one, one of the best things we've, we've done at, at New Life is call an executive pastor. Now, I realize that's, that is a, a luxury that I have now, I, I, and, and, um, and I appreciate it greatly. Uh, the likelihood is you will probably not walk into uh, a situation where you have uh, an executive pastor. It, it may be that you grow, like, like me, uh, you, 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 it, it eventually happens. It, it really has been a game changer. Uh, but the, the thing I want you to know about uh, our executive pastor, and the important thing is that he is, when you take those two words, executive and pastor, he is first and foremost a pastor. Uh, Westminster trained, theologically minded, a church planter by experience, a gifted preacher and a counselor. He's not a bean counter, right? He has, he has a lot of business experience, but he's primarily and fundamentally a pastor. So what he doesn't do, and, and this is what I, uh, what I appreciate about him and what I would insist happen, is that he doesn't just uh, uncritically lay over our church some corporate model uh, or cultural model of leadership. Now, it's not to say there isn't value uh, or benefit in these secular models of leadership. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I recognize and our executive pastor recognizes and our session recognizes that the church is not a secular organization. It's the body of Christ. And it's not going to be run by and it's not going to be led uh, at, 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 like any other kind of secular organization. Leading the church is different. So I, 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 I really believe that one of the fundamental problems with church leadership generally, guys, and this is a, you know, just a word to the wise, if you're reading these, uh, these management books, Christian or otherwise, is that we, we too often uh, uncritically import these leadership models that are long on cultural and worldly values and short on biblical values, particularly Christ-like humility. Um, look at some, if you look at some of the literature out there about church leadership, uh, a lot of what you're, you see is ind indistinguishable from literature uh, uh, coming out about secular marketplace leadership. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, I, I read recently that a pastor should have, quote, unquote, visioning capabilities. Visioning capability. Uh, meaning that you should, as a pastor, be able to uh, formulate, develop, and cast a vision for your organization. Okay. Uh, in that same article, uh, I, I read that uh, a pastor should be a strong leader who deals decisively with "Quote unquote non-visioning elements." Seriously, non-visioning elements. What what the, the author means is people, uh, essentially people who don't go along with your vision. We'll, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. But uh, um, it's uh, and deal decisively. You know what does deal decisively with? a non-visioning element look like. I suspect it doesn't look too humble. Um, a, a pastor should be able, uh, other places, every, I believe, build and manage teams. Pastors should be able to create and communicate a brand that people can rally around. You know, compare that with, with what Jesus says in, in John 13, uh, at, right after he washed his disciples' feet. I haven't even washed my executive pastor's feet, but maybe I should. Um, he said, uh, Jesus said, do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, 
and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Well, that's you know, a lot different than a lot of what you'll read uh, in the Christian uh, leadership books. Um, I'm not saying, hear me, that, that vision casting uh, or uh, team building, uh, uh, staff management, that those things are wrong or don't have value. Of course not. They, they, they all have value and they have a place. It's just as, it's just if they are applied in a kind of ham-handed, non-humble, self-exalting, uh, less than gospel-centered way, you'll, you'll find that things like vision casting will, will become a ministry stopper rather than a ministry builder. Okay. Um, here, this, I, as I was thinking about this, this lecture, guys, Perhaps the next thing I'm going to say is, is the most important because what, what it is is what I've observed, in, uh, how I've observed new, new or young past, whoops, <laughs> I forgot, I'm on the pulpit mic, uh, new or young pastors um, failing. I've, uh, I've been around long enough seen a, a, enough students come through here, enough interns come through New Life, go out uh, and, and accept calls, and then get quickly sideways with their congregations and or with their church officers, uh, which has often led to those new or young pastors getting fired or their churches imploding. Um, and. The tragedy about most of those situations is that they were largely avoidable, okay? And, and, we're, and as I've thought about it, I've seen sort of four errors that, that new or young pastors make in terms of leadership, um, and here they are. Um, number one is institutional impatience. Um, you know, wanting to produce a result or wanting to produce a change, uh, you know, sooner rather than later. Uh, it's so common, right? Because you guys will come out of here, you'll probably have strong opinions of what you think church is and what you think a church ought to be, and you walk into your first call and it doesn't match up with what you think church is and what it should be, and you want to change it right now. Now, I, I, I remember when I was being, I was candidating at New Life and, and uh, the committee, search committee was asking me questions and I could, I could clearly see there was a member of the search committee who was not a big fan of contemporary worship music. And uh, I knew New Life uses contemporary worship music uh, and uh, I had been in a service, watched it, listened to it, and sh and this person asked, "What would you, you know, what would you do differently?" And I said, "More drums." Um, that was that sort of shocked that person. Um, but had, if if, and I was joking, but it's it's sort of uh, the the where I would have really been a problem if I then accepted the call and got in and on day one, you know, said, okay, guys, we're, you know, ramping up the drums right now, right? Um, institutional impatience, wanting to produce a result or, uh, or change something um, sooner rather than later. Uh, you've all heard the, the you know, the analogy of a ship, you know, a ch church being like a battleship. You, know, you, you don't turn a battleship on a dime, and um, if you do, it's, you know, you're going to create some wreckage. And so you've you got to ramp down. The institutional impatience has been a problem. Second thing, 
Second problem that, that guy, young or new pastors get in pro trouble with is um, lack of communication, either, either with the church leaders uh, or the congregation or typically both, right? It's just a lack of communication. Couple that with institutional impatience uh, and, and it, it's a problem. Uh, you guys, the one, one of the things I learned as a lawyer is that you can't over-disclose. Um, com communication is super important, and if, and if, there's, if it's lacking, you, you're going to create surprises, and you're going to create offense that doesn't need to be created. Uh, three, third problem, uh, unilateral decision-making. Um, again, all of the, you can see how these all sort of tie, tie in or related. You know, you're the pastor, you know, you come in, uh, I, you know, I'm the guy, I'm the lead pastor, and, and I say, more drums, right? And you don't consult. Uh, you, you, you make that decision without respecting the plurality of the elders. That's going to be a problem. Okay. Uh, and then finally, number four, uh, a naive or stubborn commitment to your own vision of the church. Um, yeah, you, 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 one of the good things that's happening here, uh, and it's happening under uh, under wise faculty, who 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 are pastors, is that you are formulating, uh, you know, your your understanding uh, uh, of the church, and um, but but be careful that you aren't creating, you know, a, a your own vision of the church and then naively or stubbornly so sticking to it that you're going to end up when you be, when you get into a church alienating people who don't see your vision right okay and i would submit to, to, to you that behind all of those four problems the, the the central driving the driver is pride right the problem really is a, a lack of Christian humility. When it comes to leadership, in the words of the, of the late John Stott, uh, pride is your greatest enemy and humility is your greatest friend. So that's, let's turn now to these to, to three principles of, of church leadership um, that I hope pray and hope will help you avoid these pitfalls of institutional impatience, of lack of communication, of unilateral decision making, of naive or stubborn commitment to your own vision of the church, and, and rather allow you to lead well over the long haul. Okay? And I've called these three principles, number one, uh, defining the mission, two, moving forward together, and then three, hanging in there. Okay? Uh, defining the mission, moving forward together, and hanging in there. First, uh, defining the mission. It, it always struck me um, as somewhat of an exercise in hubris to define the mission of, a, of the church. It is, after all, not our church. Uh, we do not write on a blank slate. Um, the, the, after all, the church does come with an owner's manual. Um, as, I've been, as I've thought about this process of you know, defining the mission of a church, I, I came across Bonhoeffer's classic work, Life Together, uh, about Christian community, and, I, and I'm going to read, read a paragraph to you from his, that book, Life Together, where, where Bonhoeffer is, is at his provocative best. Um, he, he, listen to this. He says, God hates visionary dreaming. It makes the dreamer proud and pretentious. The man who fashions a visionary ideal of community demands that it be realized by God, by others, and by himself. He enters the community of Christians with his demands, sets up his own law, and judges the brethren and God himself accordingly. He stands adamant 
a living reproach to all others in the circle of the brethren. He acts as if he is the creator of the Christian community, as if his dream binds men together. When things do not go his way, he calls the effort a failure. When his ideal picture is destroyed, he sees the community going to smash. So he becomes first an accuser of his brethren, then an accuser of God, and finally the despairing accuser of himself. Now, if you don't hear in that a description of Mark Driscoll and, and others like him, um, then I don't think you're hearing it right. Now, that's overdrawn. Uh, he's Bonhoeffer's overstating for effect, but I think he makes a, a really good point. When, when we define the mission uh, of the church in a way that is, uh, and I think the assumption here, Bonhoeffer's assumption is that you're defining it in a way that's extra biblical, uh, we set the church and ourselves up for failure. Now, where, how, could, where, where, how might that happen? Well, you might see uh, an extra biblical character in the mission of a church, uh, it, for example, in... Uh, you know, a, ch a church defining its mission as being limited to a very targeted, tightly defined demographic. That might be one way. Or, or a commitment to a particular issue of social justice. Or, uh, or a particular emphasis of one issue of theology over at the expense of others, like spiritual gifts or, uh, or evangelism. Or, or missions, right? All good things, but you know, perhaps an out of balance emphasis. Um, you know, it's it really is pride that that drives this kind of entrepreneurial spirit among church pastors and leaders. But listen, brothers, we are not entrepreneurs. We are not building. Uh, Christ's church in our image. Uh, we are under shepherds in Christ's church. We are in his mission. Now, having said that, by all means, define your church's mission, vision, vision, mission, and values. That is, uh, I believe, a, a valuable, helpful uh, exercise. A few years ago, we went through with our executive pastor an extensive process at New Life where we revisited and redefined our vision and our mission and our values. Uh, you know, to be able to, to what, and what we, that really is, is, is you're distilling in, in, in compact, memorable language, right? The kind of language that you can hopefully memorize and, and repeat. It's, you know, it's, it's kind of the, the elevator talk the, uh, for, for the vision, mission, and values of your church. That's a good, if you can do that, that's a good and helpful thing. Right? It really gives you guardrails uh, in terms of you know, what do you say yes to, what do you say no to. Um, but it's absolutely essential that, that that whole exercise and then what, you co what comes out of that exercise, the vision, the mission, and the values, it's absolutely essential that those line up with what God says is the vision, mission, and values of his church, right? The, the vision, mission, and values have to be biblical. Uh, and, 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 and here, you know, the Reformed community is pretty good about that. In the larger evangelical church, you see a lot more, uh, you know, creative, extra-biblical uh, mission definition going on. Um, but, you know, when we think about it, if you go, do a survey of websites uh, or think about the, the, the vision, mission, and values of your church. I suspect they revolve around one of, I mean, revolve around three things, right? Virtually every Reformed church says we're about worship, we're about discipleship, and we're about evangelism. That's biblical. Um, now, we, we, they, we're going to say that in different ways. We'll perhaps emphasize different things, but look, if the core is worship, discipleship, evangelism, you know, you're on track. Bonhoeffer goes on to say, uh, 
I'm quoting now, because God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship, we enter into that common life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. I, I really thought that was helpful to, to me um, as a pastor. And, and think about it, even as a church planting pastor, right? If the, a church planting pastor is probably the closest thing we have to, you know, sort of what, 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 the, what the world might recognize as an entrepreneur. Even as a church planting pastor, you really receive a church. You don't envision one and then create it. We, we receive it from God. We are enlisted by God into his already underway church project. And what Bonhoeffer is saying here, and I think it's a wonderful world, word, is receive what you get from God's hand with gratitude. Right? Come into your call with gratitude for what you're receiving. Not immediately how you're going to change it. I'll give you a small but important example, uh, and one at my own expense, um, at New Life, because one of our pastors has a child with special needs. Our church began to attract uh, families in, in his network, uh, families that were impacted by disabilities and special needs. And, and, and at first, and I say this to my shame, I was not enthusiastic. Uh, it, it didn't match my vision for the church. And these families presented inconvenient challenges that I personally didn't really know how to handle. Uh, as the primary preacher, I was sometimes distracted by people with special needs moving around or, or speaking too loudly uh, during uh, the sermon. I was distracted by a, a person uh, in the congregation uh, who was suffering with Tourette syndrome, who, who, who would make involuntary sounds during the worship service. But through the gracious correction of that pastor, colleague, and, uh, and as well as some of our elders, I, I came to the realization that I was wrong, uh, that I ha was not thinking biblically about what was happening, what I was receiving, right? These, these were people God was bringing. These were the people that most needed to be embraced by our community. They, they weren't being embraced by the, by the, by the world outside the church. Uh, the, these, these families will tell you horrific stories about how, you know, for example, they'll go to a theater and, and they'll, the movie will be stopped, the lights will go on, and they will be ejected from the theater. Same thing happens with restaurants. Is the church of Jesus Christ going to do the same thing? Grief. The Church of Jesus Christ has to be the haven for those kinds of people who have, because for, for no fault of their own, been pushed to the margins because of, of a disability of, of, of a family member. Um, how could we not welcome them? And uh, so we've done that, and, and, it, uh, and it has made new life a better place. Uh, in fact, we've added some language to our bulletin, and I'll read it to you. This language is in our bulletin every Sunday um, it, where the worship order is laid out, and, and it says this, Please do not be concerned if you hear some of our members making verbal noises during our worship service. Since we are grateful to belong to the family of God through Christ's atoning sacrifice and daily receive abounding grace, through his indwelling spirit, ministering to our own deep spiritual disabilities. We welcome these differently abled brothers and sisters to our worship services and other gatherings. And that's a simple couple of lines, but it has um, meant a, a, a huge difference to uh, a lot of people who would otherwise be uh, excluded. Um, and my pastor colleague is still at New Life, but he's now working for the whole PCA. 
uh, helping churches around the country do what he helped us to do uh, with, with, with these families. None of this, the point here is, all of this happened in spite of me. Right? None of this was envisioned by me. It wasn't strategized by our leadership team. We receive these dear people from the hand of God. They are his gift to us, which we now receive with gratitude. Ministering to them is what God wants us to do. It's his mission. Okay, so defining the mission. That's, that's the first principle. Um, second principle, moving forward together. Uh, yesterday, I, I used my, uh, my f- former law firm as an example, and I'm going to do it again. It's, it's, you know, it's sort of an argument from the lesser to the, to the greater, uh, or from the um, atheists to the theists. Uh, it's, it's an argument from uh, uh, you know, the non-Christian world to the Christian world, and it's, in a way, it's sort of a rebuke, because oftentimes... The non-Christians uh, act better than we do and more biblical, more biblically than we do. Um, the managing partner of our firm was a man named Warren Christopher. Now, there are probably a few people in this room who are old enough to remember <laughs> who Warren Christopher uh, was. Warren Christopher was the United States Secretary of State under President Clinton. He also chaired the, uh, he, he, was, he was succeeded by Madeleine Albright, who, who just, just passed away. So um, uh, He also chaired the Christopher Commission, which was big local news in Southern California. The Christopher Commission was the commission that, that investigated the LAPD in the wake of the Rodney King riots. Warren Christopher was a, a brilliant lawyer and, and more than that, a towering intellect. Uh, and, and there was not a partner in our firm who would not jump off a cliff if Chris said to do it. I mean, literally, he was, we, we, we each held him in that kind of esteem. Um, uh, understand, though, uh, the firm is not a corporation. So, so Christopher is not a CEO. He's, he's a managing partner. It's a partnership, right? A general part. It was a general partnership. So the, all the partners owned the firm, right? We together owned and, 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 uh, and were responsible uh, for the firm. Uh, we, we, we voted Christopher to be our managing partner, but that didn't, we, in doing that, we didn't surrender our, our, our rights as, as partners to be responsible for the firm. Uh, but what I saw in Warren Christopher was, was, was an impressive, an impressive humility. Um, he could have, as I said, insisted on having his own way. Uh, and nobody, I mean nobody, would question it. We, 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 we would not have ever questioned it or raised an objection. But Christopher, in, in my time there, never did that. He never did that on any significant proposed initiative. Now, he was often the one proposing these initiatives. You know, let's open up a new office somewhere. Let's do, right, he's, he's, that's the managing partner's job. But, but when, when anything like that would come up, an important initiative like that, Chris would get in his car or he would jump on an airplane or he'd get on the phone and pretty soon, I could expect to get a knock on my door, uh, or a uh, or a phone call, and it, and it would be Warren Christopher, and he would take an amazing amount of time, uh, his time, to hear what I had to say and what every partner had to say uh, about what uh, about what he was proposing. He really listened to his partners. But here's the humility: if if he started hearing too much resistance from the partners about this initiative, or too many questions were being raised, that initiative would just quietly disappear, right? just go away. Or, and, and it might resurface in a restructured kind of way that dealt with the concerns that, that his partners uh, had raised. You see, Christopher wasn't just putting on a show. 
he really didn't insist on his own way when he could have. Um, he, at, at the time, there were maybe, I don't know, firm-wide, I think, 120 partners. Now think about who these people are. A lot of big, swinging egos, right? Um, and, he, and he managed to hold them together. And, and, and got them moving forward together at the cost of not always moving forward in the way he wanted to. But he was willing to bear that cost. Now that experience of working with Warren Christopher was hugely formative for me. I was a Christian at the time. I was a ruling elder in my church at the time. And, I, and so I was reflecting on what I was seeing in, in the law firm, what I was seeing in, in, in the church. And I, and I realized, first of all, that I was once again seeing non-Christians act unknowingly in, in, a, in a very Christian biblical way without any of the resources that you and I have uh, as people brought near to, to, to Jesus. Um, uh, partners operating a partnership is analogous. It's not the same, but it's analogous to a plurality of elders governing a church. Think about a se- what the senior pastor is. The senior pastor is, is, is like Warren Christopher, right? You're, because of your education, your experience, your day-to-day involvement, uh, you, you are going to be considered, like Christopher was, a kind of first among equals, right? The, your, your opinion is going to be important. Uh, in fact, if you let it, your opinion could probably be controlling. But this is where you, you have to check yourself as a senior pastor, right? It's, it's not, it's, the church is not yours to govern, Mr. Senior Pastor. That's the responsibility of all the elders, right? As the lead pastor, you probably do have, will have, the power and the influence to insist on your own way. A lot of pastors do that, right? And the session ends up being a rubber stamp. You may have seen that in your church experiences. That's not a winning strategy for a long-term pastorate. Uh, To move forward together, to lead your elders well, to have uh, them and the congregation buy in to, to your leadership, you have to do the work of building consensus, uh, right? Closely divided votes are deadly, right? We, we don't like 5-4 decisions in the United States Supreme Court. You don't want a 5-4 vote on your session and think you've won, right? How many 5-4 votes can a session uh, you know, endure before the elders are gonna be frustrated with how the church is going? and govern, how the church is governed and the direction the church is going. Uh, you, you, if, if, I'm, if I was faced with, a, 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 with what I knew was going to be a divided vote, that proposal would be tabled until we could figure out how to get, we could all, for the, you know, all of us, if possible, sometimes it's not entirely possible to get all of us on board, but to get as many of us on board uh, a, a, as possible. I, I've really come to believe that to respecting the plurality of the elders as, as a senior pastor means that you have to prioritize unity over efficiency. And, you know, you're going to come out of here and you're going to want to be efficient, right? It's that institutional impatience. Uh, um, that is, but to, to, to lead with unity over efficiency, to, to, you know, to have leadership that is, depends on consensus building is, is just, it's going to take time and effort. It just realize, it, you know, yeah, I'm going to get, uh, we'll get there. there I, I had issues at New Life with, with, you know, shape of the worship service, tone of the worship service composition of the worship service. But, but, you know, there are a lot of vested interests and a lot of, um, and, and, and so, you know, it, it moved. You compare what we're doing now to what we were doing 20 years ago, it's very different. Uh, but we, we got there almost imperceptibly, right? And, and, and the leadership was all brought along, all bought in, and the congregation was as well. And, and, and so we didn't have, you know, some wrenching turn where, where people are upset and people leave. 
You know, it's not necessary. So, um, and to do that, by the way, to, to, to build consensus um, really requires communication, right? That's the point of Chris. Chris Christopher communicated. Um, so no elder, none of your elders, none of your deacons, really no member of your church should be surprised by any action you end up taking as a leader of the church, right? They, they should all have been kept in the loop all, you know, in the process so that when, when a decision's finally made, it's not, it's, not, it's not coming out of left field for people. Um, and when some ministry initiative that is your personal, uh, you know, crusade, you know, it's some ministry initiative that you've, you've championed gets cratered by your elders, and it'll happen. Uh, you know, it's happened uh, a number of times for me. Um, don't take it personally. Um, I, was, I'm temp I was tempted to do it sometimes. Even now I'm tempted to take it personally. Um, but, you know, look to Jesus, look to his humility and his submission to his Father. Remind yourself that the church is not about you, that leadership is not primarily about you getting your way. It's about leading well and leading biblically, uh, and you do that when you honor Christ and respect the plurality of the elders he's raised up in your congregation. And what I've actually found out now, I'm actually experience this with with some relief and some gratitude because now d d you know it really if 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 you really are respecting the plurality of the elders leadership isn't all on your shoulders right the decisions aren't all on your shoulders i mean the the, the decisions that are being made c come from the the collective wisdom of the elders and what i have always found out um is that uh, on those in those cases where uh, I I my my way was overturned, uh, they were right, and uh, so I've learned to, to you know trust that process, be grateful for it, uh, and to enjoy the freedom of it, right? To to not have to bear the whole yoke of leadership uh, alone. All right. Okay, finally, third principle, and we'll be done. I'm sorry, I've gone on a little bit. Um, almost done. Uh, high priestly prayer, John 17. Jesus prays, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me. Right, that wonderful moment. This is the moment where Jesus is at his most glorious, Right? Uh, he's, he's supremely glorified in his dying to, re to, to accomplish his rescue mission. He's at his most beautiful, his most powerful, his most moving, his most effective when he is at his weakest, when he's hanging in there, when he's staying to finish his work, when he's hanging on a cross for undeserving people. Uh, now that, that sounds strange in, in the leadership culture until you think about it in human terms, right? We've all been moved in recent weeks. I certainly have been by, by uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky's moment, right? When offered safe passage out of the Ukraine by the U.S., right, he said, the fight is here. I, I need ammunition, not a ride. Uh, when, when, when rumor was flying around uh, uh, Ukraine that he had left the country, uh, he posted a selfie video with members of his leadership team. And, and he said, I am here. We are all here. Our military is here. Citizens and society are here. We're all here defending our independence, our country, and it will stay this way. And it, it takes a humble and a courageous leader to not exercise your leadership prerogatives and escape to asylum. Right, which everybody would have expected him to do. Right? Uh, but instead, stay, hang in there, and suffer, and perhaps die with and for your people. Now, some might regard Zelensky uh, as, as foolish and weak and sort of quixotic 
uh, for doing that, right? That he's got no chance, that the odds are all against him. This is foolish. He's not being realistic. I would argue that what he's being is gloriously strong. And in doing that, he is, again, unknowingly, as an unbeliever, unknowingly casting a faint, far-off shadow of what Jesus Christ actually did for you and me. Um, Jesus came and he hung in there, right, literally, hung in there, hung on a cross. He could, Jesus could have exercised his leadership prerogatives as the Son of God and escaped to asylum, but he stayed. And what kept him on the cross was his love for his people. And that, friends, should be the model for your pastoring. With humility and courage, simply hang in there. Keep on preaching Christ when it, even when you're opposed, even when it seems weak and foolish next to political and cultural power. Stay where you are out of love for your people. Right? Just hanging in there like that for your people images Jesus. You're imaging Jesus in that for your people, and you're giving them the peace and the comfort that their pastor, like Jesus, is with them, and he's not going to leave them or forsake them for a bigger, sexier, more influential, more noticed position. To paraphrase D.A. Carson, the ultimate display of God's glory is not after the shame of the cross, it's in the shame of the cross. May we as pastors, friends, deny ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow our Savior. That's true Christ-like leadership. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for my brothers here, um, and uh, I, I pray for them as leaders and future leaders of the church. I pray for their studies here. I pray for their faculty as their faculty prepares them for the leadership that they will take up and i pray lord that we will take it up uh like you uh like you did and uh with humility and with